welcome uh, to ATX Biz Talks. Um, I'm Matt Winters, owner of Austin Visuals 3D Animation Studio. We make marketing videos, ads training, virtual reality. If you have a marketing video, think of us. My email is matt, M-A-T-T, at austinvisuals.com. Uh, if you want an invite to these future talks, just email me and I'll send you an invite. So we've got a good lineup of uh, four uh, business uh, entrepreneurs that will be speaking to us about their uh, trials and tribulations and how they're adjusting to the COVID um, events that's happening. So uh, I wanted to just start off by saying I brought these great speakers together so that uh, you at home can understand what's happening lo locally and how great entrepreneurs, business owners are adjusting to um, the changing times. So um, it's in our blood to persevere. And I think it's an amazing story to tell as it's happening. And uh, the idea behind these talks is that hopefully you'll learn some information that you can maybe apply to your own business. Or if you're thinking of starting your business, it's always good to know what's, what's involved. So, so I'd like to start off by kind of, uh, there was a, a very uh, impactful story that just happened before the, that I got word of um, about an hour ago that I'll share briefly. So there, I, I uh, live on Rainy Street in downtown Austin, Texas, and uh, there is a food trailer that I always go to. I uh, won't name the exact one, but uh, it is absolutely delicious food, and the owner there, um, we've always had this rapport. So I was uh, doing my normal walk and just down the street, and then um, <clears throat> as I ordered my food, the uh, biz the food trailer business owner let me know that it, just this morning he had uh, a break-in incident uh, to where um, there was a, a person that went into his food trailer and uh, attempted to uh, rob him. So uh, he happened to have a, a gun in a holster, the, the you know open carry kind of thing, and uh, so he pulled the gun on the guy, and uh, and the guy ran away. Um, and so I, as I was uh, walking around uh, the, the street, I had noticed before, uh, before I went to the uh, food trailer, I had noticed that there was about eight cops around and uh, the, the cops instructed him as he was chatting or he told me this story uh, that if the person comes back, that the person doesn't need to go into his business in order for him to shoot. So I kind of mentioned that because I, in the year I've lived on Rainy Street for about five years, and uh, this kind of thing doesn't happen very often. And I can't help but think that is, you know, it is a, kind of a sign of the times, as you know, as uh, the COVID event starts to c continue, then it may, may cause more desperate times. So, but I also share the story in, if you have your own business and you're out there in a, in a physical sense, just be cautious. So, <clears throat> so I'd like to start off by introducing Krista Freeland. She uh, was at a tech venture studio downtown and she started the ATX kit, uh, which is the easiest uh, way to buy a 10 pack of food items for yourself while supporting uh, 10 local small businesses. So Krista, how's it going? Yeah, thank you. Well, farmers market vendors are going to have to think about how to sell in a new way. And that's something that I know how to do. Um, my, my whole world has been like online and tech software and mobile apps. So um, it's kind of funny, and I think that maybe some of y'all will even think about this, like, we're just so used to, like, moving fast and building quickly, um, usually on things, product, tech products that aren't really existing yet. And here, there is, you know, vendors right outside my door having a product that they need to sell, and they need to be online. So that's one of the reasons why I started. And to be honest, I had this idea. I bought the website domain off of GoDaddy, atxstarterkit.com. And I noticed that um, um, while Austin had been growing, 
Um, we had like 100 plus people moving every day. Local businesses weren't really feeling the effects of that growth. And so I thought about doing this idea a year ago, almost exactly in March. And it was just a crazy like goosebumps moment when GoDaddy emailed me and they're like, hey, are you going to re-register this domain? I was like, oh shit, no, I actually bought, I'm actually doing it now. <laughs> like it is actually go time. So, and it's been um, a lot of positives and some weird, you know, challenges along the way. Like when I did a mass pitch event, you know, to um, a bunch of PR people and, uh, and, you know, people in the news, one person got back to me and they were like, um, I'm actually furloughed this week, so I'm locked out of my email and I can't work. So I'll be able to get to your stuff next week and we can talk about it then, but I won't have access. So running into stuff like that, I personally have Frost Bank and I've been banking with them for almost 10 years. I, I wanted to open up a business account when I launched and they were saying, oh, we're not doing, we're not opening up new business accounts anymore. So these kind of challenges, you know, along the way are something, some things that I faced, but um, I'll say overall, you know, having one purchase that you can make that will impact more than 10 entrepreneurs has been um, uh, a really you know worthy thing to work on. I Half the vendors have told me, I mean, we talk about like half the people doing, they're doing fine. The other half are kind of really struggling. And half the vendors are like, yeah, your order um, is helping us keep afloat for longer. So um, yeah, just think about distribution in new ways, a new marketing engine, a sales mechanism, a new distribution model. That's like something that the ATX kit encompasses for these vendors. And I take my um, experience in digital strategy. I was hired on uh, or asked to work on the mayor of Austin's digital campaign. And, um, you know, it was, a, it was a successful campaign. Um, Fort Worth mayor heard about it and they hired me to do a digital campaign for them in Fort Worth. We submitted both campaigns to the American Association of Political Consulting and they both won awards. You know, we got a silver and then in Fort Worth, we got a gold medal. And I just know digital campaigns a lot and just getting creative about the outreach strategy and new ways of, of thinking about things. Um, that's how we're going to get through this. You know, like we got to do like creative deals. We're doing things that we've never done before. We have to move quickly and things that used to work in the old world just don't work now. They don't. So yeah, I, anyways. I, I agree. Yeah, the, um, could you tell the, the audience, I guess, for people that don't know, a little bit about your background or uh, your, your education, how, how you got into this space or got interested in it? Yeah, well, um, I went to school at Texas State University and I graduated with mass communications and minored in business. And the first job that I had when I moved to Austin, I graduated in 2010, so I entered the job market um, also, it was a terrible time, you know, there were just no jobs to be had, but at least back then, you know, I just started, I could have like folded shirts, I could have worked, you know, in hospitality, I could have worked, you know, anything. Now, these kids don't have that. Everything is closed. So, I will say that um, starting my career in a uphill battle, I would have paid to have an internship at that point. You know, there were just no jobs. Um, so I think, you know, hitting the ground running, you know, like a fire under my ass, I had to keep going. So naturally I was uh, really attracted to the startup scene. You know, I liked making a big difference. I liked working in small intimate groups. I liked working on something that was, maybe it was like high risk, it was high potential, high reward. And um, I started doing marketing for um, a startup that was out of one of the, the tech studio that I, was working for him. And um, I've been at the tech studio for about seven years, but um, sort of like the way it works is I'm fractional on, on different companies. So I'm running the marketing on the, the small portfolio that we have. But uh, recently, pretty much everybody was laid off. And um, when, when was that? What, what time? 
That right. was in early March. And a lot of our investors came from China, so I'll just say that. Did you see that you know, started, or did you see that coming, or did you hear things that were changing in February? Uh, no, not not at all, actually. That's kind of how the startup thing works, too. No one really knows what's going on. All of a sudden, there's just no money. You know, I think it could have been handled a lot better, but that's in the past and we have to like focus on building and being creative and stuff and just moving on. You know, it was, it was really shitty. We were all like, what the fuck just happened? You know? Um, but you know, we're resilient people. Austin, Austinites are creative and we're like really um, collaborative too about the community and what we can do. So, um, so you, you brought together the ATX kit, uh, can you kind of give us the the twenty second pitch of yeah, sure. how we can get involved? Or we have a box. We ship these boxes. Um, I wasn't gonna show all ten, but I'll show you like what you know everyone's favorites has been. We actually have Stroop waffles, but I'm low on inventory because we sold. We did pretty well the first you know kits and stuff. But we have jerky and stuff. Every every entrepreneur that we have in our kit is local. Um, they either have operations in Austin or they live in Austin. We've got like a tea here and this makes, this is concentrated tea. So it actually makes eight servings. So it's a lot of like high value, like really yummy stuff. And it's, it's actually been a really great taste profile of Austin. And so if you didn't like one thing, you know, you can obviously share with your neighbor, or your friends, your family. Um, steam espresso, um, this is a, actually a double shot espresso. You can dilute it with, you know, almond milk or oat milk or like, you know, whatever they're doing these days. There's like honey, all this stuff. Um, we have Stroop waffles, we have um, oatmeal and, um, and we have like chocolate bar, all that stuff. So 10 items, actually ends up being 13 food items from 11 entrepreneurs. And we do offer a five pack as well. And um, funny enough, people, I guess people who are attracted to the concept, they just like go big or go home kind of thing. And so we've mostly been selling the, the 10 pack kits. But and, yeah, and, and uh, just a quick- You get one of these in your door and um, usually it ships, well, USPS has been a little crazy. So it usually it ships between three and four days. And uh, if someone wants to order, they just go to atxkit.com. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, and so last parting question before we go to our next speaker is, uh, do you have any um, final tips for people that are in, in a similar kind of space uh, for how to adjust to COVID? Um, I would just say, you know, keep up with your mental health, you know, in startup world, we like to hit the ground running, go really fast, but it will catch up with you. And um, I don't know, for myself, I try to think about it. We can always change our perspective, right? And I want to look back on this and think, was I like scared? You know, was I living in fear the whole time? Was I mad? Was I sad? Like all this stuff. And although like, that's okay to feel those things, but it's also like, I would like to look back and think of like, damn, we had fun. That was like an adventure. And it was like wild west. We're cutting deals like left and right. Like, fuck it, you know, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I know I shouldn't use those words, but like to uh, convey the enthusiasm, it's like, no man, this is an adventure. Yep. Well, so, I appreciate yeah. your enthusiasm and it, we do enjoy the process. So, so it gets us through. So thank you so much for your time, Krista. So next we have uh, Jonas. You uh, unmute or? Okay. What's up, man? Can you hear me? Yes. How's it going? Good. Good, good. How are you? Great. Uh, so I'll, I'll do a brief introduction. So uh, Jonas is the founder of Infinite Fitness. Uh, they have recently switched to 100% virtual model and have been exploring ways to bring value to their clients in times like these. So Jonas, if you could take it away. Yeah, yeah, so um, I'm super grateful to, to be able to uh, do, the, do the biz talk with y'all. I saw the last one, I thought it was a really cool idea. 
Um, a short background about me. I um, moved to Austin about five years ago, uh, opened up a fitness. I've been in fitness the whole time. Opened up a, a fitness company for, for a guy that I just met. So talk about kind of getting thrown, thrown in there and, and just jumping off uh, the cliff. Uh, started one for him or helped him open a location. Um, then I, I started a couple of concepts on my own that weren't brick and mortar based. Um, cause you know, a lot of the times it's like, it's not scalable thing to do is just have that kind of business. But, um, the, after those two, uh, you know, basically didn't, didn't really work out the way I, I wanted for different reasons. I opened up our, started working on our physical location. So, which is infinite fitness. Um, we do semi-private training, um, uh, strength conditioning type of model. So a little bit different between classes and one-on-one, -on -one, just, uh, you know, in simple terms. Um, I think that uh, we, we, we've we switched overnight as well. Somebody was, uh, Christine was talking about um, kind of just, you know, moving fast. Uh, we went from, from fully in person to overnight uh, to, to everybody online, um, like over, over one weekend. Um, and we, yeah, we've been around pretty, pretty short amount of time, but that's, that's a little bit about me. Thank you so much for the intro. And uh, so tell me a little bit about your background. How did you get into the, the fitness arena? Um, yeah, I graduated in tech uh, in, in Lubbock. I'm from kind of the area back there. And uh, I knew that Austin had a ton of opportunities. So I kind of just moved here um, with the hopes of kind of figuring it out. Um, as I got here, I'd, I've been here once. And I just knew it was a really big industry here. Oh, well, bigger than, than what was back home. Um, so that's kind of what got me into it. I was always passionate being some type of athletic background. Um, obviously, you know, high school sports, like, like most everybody else did triathlon stuff in high school. Um, found that that was kind of our niche in performance training, that there's a big endurance community here. Um, you know, highest injury rate is in running as for, in any sport. You know, you think of weightlifting, football, like the highest injury rate is really in running. So uh, just found a population that really needed it um, and started working on marketing ourselves and branding ourselves um, partly around that um, decided on the semi-private model basic based on uh, I didn't really like the boot camp stuff I had a business that we contracted with uh, office companies for um, office parks for boot camps and stuff I didn't really like being outside and not that loud either so um, figured that that was the most efficient model. I think that one-on-one -on -one is kind of like not going to be in the future. It's just not really efficient. Um, and it's been kind of dying off. So, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I've been, um, kind of observing like the market and, and how they have now that, um, that task force that's tasked with reopening businesses. So I'm going to be curious to see, cause as far as like fitness goes or gyms, like the models are so varying. It's like, how do you compare somebody like us to like goals to any other boot camp? So um, I'm a little interested to see how that, that plays out. And, and, you know, the thing is with, in our industry specifically, I think there's going to be a pretty drastic change coming out on the other side of this. Um, you know, you see videos of people wearing gloves everywhere and things like that. And, and, you know, like rubber gloves, you know, everybody's in the, in the mask and, it's like people aren't going to just go back to the way it was before. <clears throat> um, so I think, uh, you know, we had, it was funny, we had a meeting on Friday uh, with the, with my staff and um, I have some trainers, marketing, a uh, small marketing team and, and uh, office uh, admin, my assistant. And so this was like the Friday before the mandate is shut down. And um, I had been wanting to get into online training because I know there's, opportunity in it. Um, but just being in the day-to-day -day business, it was kind of hard, um, to even work on that model of the business. Um, and I'm more of a focused person. Like I get really focused on one thing and just, um, um, put all my energy into that. Um, so I've been wanting to get into online training, but basically from Friday, um, it's, we made, I made the decision that we have to have all of this software set up. We're using an already existing software, so we don't have our own right now, but and we have to get everything uploaded into the software and have this model pretty much built out with at least like a minimum viable product ready to go by like by Sunday. So um, we worked, there was a few of us that worked all day Saturday. We hired some, we outsourced some work to some um, people overseas to kind of help us. So it, was, it was a little bit, it was quite, it was pretty meticulous. So um, we, we outsourced, outsourced some stuff and, and pretty much got everything streamlined um, so that way it was a pretty ex seamless experience um, and our and our clients were able to pick up right where they left off 
we actually leased our own equipment um, to the and the clients took uh, almost all the equipment and you know we didn't charge them but we our goal was to kind of just stabilize where we were at because we were on a pretty good trajectory um, and, and what, what was that trajectory as of let's say February March um, February March so the first so we've only been in business a year and a half um, so I'd come in with an existing clientele base in the first um, in the first year we over tripled in size and then um, we're probably on rate to grow another 40% uh, this year. Um, I'm really focused on marketing and sales and I have some other people focused on um, the training, the admin work, things like that. And I'm still involved in, in the training and the managing, but I'm trying to um, become more into or move just more into strictly marketing and sales and, and, and kind of managing. Um, so, and in, and in general, uh, how, how big is your team? Uh, we have, we just have five, there's just five of us right now. And then I have a couple of people overseas that are um, doing some more work for us as well. So. And um, so, so then uh, after, I guess, COVID hit, what, what are some, I guess, thing, discussions that you had uh, that, that started changing how you were, were reacting to the situation? Um, yeah. So the discussions that we started having is, um, I think it was kind of mentioned earlier is that like uh, there's still a need to be met, right? Like the farmers still have food, like there's a need to be met with, through that product as well. So clients still have the same needs as they did coming to the gym. They're just not able to come to the gym anymore. And the reality of it is, is like they didn't come because we have a certain brand of kettlebells or because of our, you know, equipment or like they came because of for pretty much five reasons that we've identified is um, what we're calling like our five pillars is, people need accountability, right? They need um, somewhere to show up, somebody to answer to, somebody to keep them accountable. Um, they need guidance. Um, so they need to learn how to do these, uh, the certain movements properly so they don't get hurt. Um, and this is just over years of, of doing different consultations. They, need, they, they end up staying for community. So they find a community here. We do community events. We're doing community events online now. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that. Um, and they come for structure. They want you know a little bit of structure um, structure as far as like what to do and so those are just a few of the things that they come to us for and our team has been brainstorming on how to deliver that virtually um, because I see a lot of business owners in my realm that are just like they are just like shutting down and just pausing and I think that's a really horrible idea right now because there's no more normal anymore of what we know you know things are going to change people's mannerisms and how they interact are going to be different so the typical gym setting it is, I don't think it's going to be the same ever again. And so we're looking at a couple different models to, to adjust, but basically um, we're just about transferring that value virtually. We have different Facebook groups. We have like game nights. I mean, just, you know, some of the simple stuff that we're doing, we have like a structure for accountability within the software we're using. So you check in, we check in with you, we build habits into this. Um, we're just delivering that we're doing the same deliver. We're um, marketing the same deliverable we're just being creative in how we market that and how we deliver it virtually. So that's great. And uh, when you said you're looking at different uh, solutions, are you researching that online or are you just creating just new discussions just b based on? Yeah. Two things? Yeah. Um, uh, both really. So we're looking at things internally, like structural ways to be more efficient. Um, you know, the good thing for us is that like 40% of Austin's over, or over 40% is able to work remote. So um, we have about 95% client retention on um, our switch to virtual. So a lot of people lost all revenue. Like we're really fortunate to have not done that. All my team is still employed. We, we had a team member that was scheduled to start on the Monday after we closed down. They're still like employed. They don't have any training to do, but we're, we're having them kind of switch roles and and the team's been adjusting. So internally, we're, we're working on some on some tactics and some strategy on how to keep people and deliver those things that we were just talking about. And then externally, I'm kind of, um, I've kind of stepped out of the business mostly. One of my head trainers, he's running the virtual uh, interface and, and, and creating the programs and, and doing the client reach outs and things like that. And I'm working on a couple other models. And <clears throat> I've been I'm talking to you and a couple of friends about it. And um, I think that VR um, has been a little bit of far, uh, too far of, uh, or too, it was too early to, for any like um, advancements in VR, AR. And I think 
that now is a time that kind of, if there was anything that was going to push people towards that, like right now is the time. So um, I've been researching and, and kind of um, on top of everything else that I'm doing, I've been researching um, how to meet that need and incorporate some type of uh, more high tech solutions um, and just be, be ahead uh, of what's going to happen because what I think is that this is either going to put people ahead or it's going to put people out of business. So we can either be ahead of our competition when we come out or we can be like barely hanging on. So those are, those are great thoughts. In there. Yeah. So um, I'm doing that. I'm looking for a group of kind of mastermind to in the fitness industry of, of uh, you know, people that are forward thinkers, innovators, um, trying to kind of gather up some people and, kind of like what Christina was saying, maybe just slightly stimulate the economy and helping us all move forward collectively. So, um, so, so as far as uh, any uh, closing thoughts, uh, what advice do you have for other business owners that are in your similar space? I would say <laughs> the main advice is don't freeze up, you know, um, don't, don't expect things to go back to any type of normal um, and try and figure out a way to continue doing business and providing value right now. Because if there's somebody in your, there's somebody in everybody's industry that's still operating their business that have just switched to some type of virtual model. I was talking to a friend about that the other day. It's like, there's some massage therapist right now that is somehow generating revenue and have pivot, has pivoted um, and, and is, and is um, and working on the next thing. So that's, that's what I would say if I wanted to stay in business and any advice that I would have. So. And uh, how can anybody uh, if that's interested and sees this video, uh, get involved with your, um, fitness programs yeah so our fitness programs you can go to infinitefitnessaustin.com www.infinitefitnessaustin.com um, if you're interested in any of the um, collabs that I mentioned also maybe uh, like a mastermind type group if you're in that industry and, and you're you know looking for support you can reach out to me directly info at jonasacevedo.com so my first name my last name um, and also if you have any <clears throat> experience in like VR, AR, and, and maybe um, have any ideas on, on any guidance on that, then yeah, I'd love to definitely touch base with you as well. So great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Jonas. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, so next we have uh, James. Uh, he's a residential mortgage loan officer and he helps families of all shapes and sizes navigate the maze. Uh, of qualifying for a mortgage and securing the home of their dreams. So how's it going, James? Good, man. Good, good to be here. Thanks. Thanks for putting this together. I appreciate it. Sure. Um, so yeah, take, take it away with the, tell us a little more about your, yourself and your background. Yeah, sure. Um, I went to school for psychology. Um, I love learning things and I love philosophy. And so that obviously segues into finance. So that's a joke. Um, so no, I, uh, I, I grew up in food service when I was, uh, in college, I worked at Kirby Lane cafe for a long time. Interesting to see how they've been navigating this in, in all restaurants, you know, very, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, obviously, you know, Chris you have to get really good cheese dip. Yeah. 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 2 AM. Get that, that competitive advantage. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, liquid gold. Um, so, you know, there, I, I of course, I, I love customer interaction and, you know, you learn sense of urgency and food service is a great place to accrue skills, despite maybe what some people may think. But ultimately, I realized that I, I love people and, um, and I love serving people. And, um, but I also wanted to support a family. So I knew that there was opportunity in finance and specifically in mortgage lending to do all of those things for my family. And so, um, you know, I got, got into the biz a couple of years ago uh, with a, a local startup uh, mortgage company called Infinity Mortgage. Um, it's a great company owned by an amazing man and Jonas has a, <laughs> a little branding there. Um, you know, great guy with a great heart. Um, and so I learned a lot there um, and was grateful for that experience. Um, and as things have evolved, um, you know, I've uh, just been developing my own, my own brand and my own business. I was a broker for a little while. And now I'm a branch manager at Home Vantage Mortgage. It's a local uh, community bank called Austin Capital Bank. Home Vantage lives inside. So 
um, that's, that's how I got here. And um, yeah, I do, you know, everything from lot loans to construction loans to refinances. And obviously people are, uh, just to kind of jump ahead a little bit, there's mortgage is such a boring topic. No one cares about mortgage until they need one, which happens twice in their life. And uh, so then all of a sudden when Fed cuts the mortgage rate to zero, everyone's like, wait, what does that mean? What does that mean for my home, my mortgage? You know, can I refi at a 0% interest rate? You know, so um, it's, been, it's been interesting um, to try and educate my, uh, my friends and family and everyone on social media um, just about what's, what's been happening. So, so how many clients uh, were you managing or were coming into, you know, the, the funnel per se, uh, you know, around February or so and, you know, January, February, and then what, what shifted in the past couple of months? So incidentally, and I, I really appreciate following um, Jonas and Chris, actually, it's been, um, so mortgage as an industry has been evolving to be primarily digital um you fed you rewind 20 years and and loan originators myself i take an application from a customer i would walk that to my processor's office and then they would walk that physical file from their office to the underwriter's office so and this this is 20 years ago and so as the industry has been evolving and technology has been permeating the industry um things have been becoming excessively digital. I mean, I, I, now it's, I send you a link and you download my mobile app and you fill out the loan app there. And then I, I look at it on my computer and then I let my processor know that it's time to look at it. And every, everyone's been, we've been evolving to just a very digital experience over the last about 10 years. Um, so to answer your question, um, around January and February rates really started to, to drop. And perhaps you guys knew that great time to refinance. Um, if you have an interest rate above about 4%, it's, you, you can cut your interest rate by a point, you know, save you a couple hundred bucks a month. So that has been, um, people have been coming in droves. Just to give you an idea, in April, right? So we are in the thick of COVID right now. Stay at home, masks, you name it. Um, refinances are up 225% from this time last year. So again, it's just, it's just interesting to, to follow Jonas where revenue has dropped to zero, whereas lenders, mortgage lenders in April have maybe double the revenue that they did this time last year or more. So it's been interesting. However, what has been occurring is that there have been some unprecedented uh, regulatory tightening all across the industry. And so how that's manifest in what we can do for families, um, you know, you go to Chase right now to try and get a home loan, you better have a 700 plus credit score and 20% down or you're not getting a loan. So obviously that's not the case. I mean, if you, if you were to come to me, I still have all of the traditional options, 3% down, we can, you know, low, lower, lower credit scores. Um, but what that's done to us is that loan officers across the industry, title companies, real estate agents, everyone that's involved in the real estate transaction, everyone has started to communicate like we never have before, which is really interesting. I'm, I'm talking to you know, people literally all over the country as in California, what they're able to do is different from what we're able to do here. And um, the, the different, I mean, for example, um, uh, loan amounts above a certain threshold almost aren't available right now. Um, so we're just seeing unprecedented shifts in what's available. So it has less to do with, um, you know, how many families we're serving at any given time. Cause again, those numbers are up, but what we're able to do and what we're able to offer is, is changing daily. And so staying on top of what those changes are and knowing who can do what, um, is, 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 has been huge. Um, and, and so uh, what do you see, I guess, in the next, you know, three to six months? Do you, do you, how do you see the, the shift evolving? Are you, you think you'll be able to keep pace or with all the demand? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what's, what's interesting is that, um, 
there's just, there's a whole lot of super uninteresting explanation as to why lots of mortgage lenders, despite the, um, despite the, the influx of business are in big trouble. Um, and it's not because they don't have enough clients. It's because, mm, for example, just one, one technical explanation of when mortgage rates get incredibly low, super fast, there's basically, that's, that's, that's a real problem for mortgage lenders because the way that they hedge risk, um, that essentially turns into you, you have to front money based on your risk model. So I'm having to, as a small mortgage lender, that's not me, fortunately, but some smaller lenders are having to pay out hundreds of thousands of dollars or even billions of dollars. And if you don't have that liquidity, you're in real trouble. So what, what, what's going to happen over the next six months? I think that smaller lenders are, are going to perhaps be gobbled up by bigger lenders, very similar to what we saw in 2008, where some of these smaller banks just, it, the rules are, are set against them, unfortunately, and there's really nothing that they can do about it. So, um, but they still have people, uh, they still have uh, industry professionals, and they just need to be housed in, um, in, uh, in a business model that basically was designed to weather this storm. Um, well, great. Um, well, so James, uh, we're kind of out of time, uh, but uh, how can people reach out to you if they have any questions? Yeah, sure. Um, love to, um, I give out my cell phone number. Um, you can reach me at 512-468-1207. Great place to, to initiate contact if you want to know what mortgage rates are or, you know, uh, what what you should do um, would love love to connect with you there or you, or you can email me at j shell s c h e l l at homevantage.com I, I have to say one more thing I, sure. I want to want to get to Trevor obviously that is a cool cat there for sure but um, guys forbearance people have been hearing about forbearance I can I can use forbearance forbearance is basically where I don't I don't pay my mortgage perhaps for a month or two months or six months. Um, it is a very, very, very dangerous thing to do. There are about five reasons why you shouldn't and only one that you should. And that is that I am unemployed. I have no friends or family that can support me. I, I have to, I will not foreclose on my home. I have to accept forbearance. But at this time, if, if you can pay your mortgage, you, you absolutely have to. There are some intense consequences for, um, right now there's about 6% of, um, excuse me, yeah, there's a, a, a huge number of people that are going into forbearance. So I just needed to get that disclaimer out there. It's a very, very dangerous thing to be doing right now. And I can um, obviously explain that more later, but. Sure, well, thank you for sharing and appreciate you, uh, your time. Thank you. So next we have uh, Trevor Goodchild. He's a blogger, book author, and Facebook policy expert with three years of experience working for Facebook in ads and tech. So Trevor. How's it going? It is going in quite interesting times. Uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stranger. Um, so we are <laughs> definitely living in one of those eras. So, um, so tell us a little bit about your background and uh, I'd love to hear about it. Sure. So I have a very uh, unique background in that I grew up living uh, as a homeless teenager. I didn't really have anyone to support me, but it was interesting how that actually drove me to develop skill sets that helped me become an entrepreneur uh, because I had to become self-sufficient as a teenager living on the streets and had to make adult decisions. And as a result of that, I developed a aptitude for really researching, finding out things, resources, making plans and executing them and strategies uh, for what works versus just guesswork. And it really, led to kind of me overshooting because um, I wasn't looking to do just enough. I wanted to keep getting better, keep improving. So I went from living in a cardboard box to getting accepted into the University of Texas with a recommendation letter from the president of Austin Community College and ended up uh, taking a break from college for a few years at UT and got recruited um, to work at Facebook. Uh, if you've ever seen The Matrix, it was very similar. Um, I got this phone call, and who was on the phone? It was Facebook. I was like, no, it's not Facebook. Mr. Anderson, we've had our eye on you for quite some time. And it was just 
one of those things where I was really incredulous, but they'd seen my resume online and they wanted me to work for them in ads. And so it wasn't until I went through the doors at Facebook, I was like, oh, I'm really working there. Okay. So I did that. I got promoted uh, after working in ads to back in tech, supporting servers. If Facebook was loading slow for you or crashing, I was working on it with the engineers in Menlo Park that write the code that makes sure Facebook stays online. And so I uh, took the leap for entrepreneurship um, full time. I've been doing stuff on the side for a long time. I even sold Kirby vacuums door to door when I was uh, like 19 or 20. You know, you got to have real perseverance to get through those uh, door knocking episodes. Uh, don't do that in uh, Williamson County. Come out with shotguns. But uh, it was, <laughs> you know, one of those formative experiences like you got to have uh, that grind. And so I decided because there was such a demand that I should go full time with my own business. I've tried several different businesses and this was the one that took off was being a Facebook policy expert, helping agencies if they don't know why Facebook's disapproved an ad or disabled an ad account or they just have a problem with Facebook and they've gone silent characteristically. Those of us in the advertising sphere that advertise on Facebook know how frustrating it is to have an issue. Uh, with Facebook and they're giving you cryptic or no answers at all. I having an encyclopedic knowledge of both advertising and tech at Facebook can actually provide those answers, which is a great relief to a lot of my customers. Why do they give cryptic answers, by the way? Um, If I told you, I'd have to kill you. Um, (laughs) uh, We've had our eye on you quite some time, Mr. Winters, but uh, no, it was, uh, it's one of those things. And it's a real triumph for me because, you know, one of the things that I guess entrepreneurs have to overcome is the fear of failure, but really to quote like Shakespeare, there's nothing to fear, but fear itself, right? That's bigger than the actual action. And so now as of like last month or two months ago, I was running point on the ads Tony Robbins did on uh, one of his recent launches with Dean Graciosi or whatever, making sure he was in spec for Facebook. I was like, wow, okay, so that's pretty cool. And it's, it's amazing, but I've had to adjust uh, with the crisis. Things have changed uh, differently. Not as much as a retail store, thank God, because entrepreneurs were adapted to, to change and work remote. But um, in this case, like my client acquisition strategy had to completely change because most of it was just in-person referrals, you know, uh, people that I worked with. I went to marketing conferences, the conversations conference by mini chat. You know, I went to local meetups and things like that. But I didn't I don't have a funnel. I don't run ads on Facebook saying, hey, I'll reveal the secrets of Facebook to you. It doesn't really work that way. Um, so, so what were your main projects uh, or, or what were you working on February, March? So yeah, something really crashed and burned uh, there. I was trying to uh, pivot into a different industry and do e-commerce. And I even had a small time investor, one of my friends who's a millionaire, gave me some money, some capital to forward towards e-commerce. And you know, he wasn't keeping tabs, he's just whatever, we're friends. But because of the fact that I lost clients who re- relied on their clients, there were agencies that ran ads, who were brick and mortar type people. And they're like, Hey, sorry, Trevor, you know, we're losing clients. We can't have you on board anymore. I had to shift and reallocate that into just operating expenses. And my dream of, you know, e-commerce just kind of went down the drain for a bit, put on pause at least. And that was kind of big. Um, Client acquisition changed now to online instead of in-person events. So now um, I'm getting new clients successfully through forums and different stuff, answering questions online, things like that. And it's working. Uh, in fact, even better than before because you can, you know, maximize distribution easier digitally than in person. There's only one of me, you know, so until they make cloning legal or whatever. Um, so, so you're, yeah. uh, I guess before COVID, your main source of income was through online means. Uh, but in person. Your- Okay, and you well, were acquiring new for leads. acquisition. Yeah, yeah, for acquisition events. Yeah, and so now client acquisition had to change to online, which was uh, quite a shift. Fortunately, I have plenty of friends that are entrepreneurs and startup startup founders and stuff. So, got a few tips about places to look and go, and that was cool. Um, but you know, I had to get through that that panic, that analysis paralysis of like googling too much. And you just being freaked Googling out. Googling the news. Yeah. Yep. That and then coronavirus you know, news. That's that's the overtaking Trump news. Oh God. 
and uh, don't look on Twitter. And then there's just <laughs> the whole, like, to go back to, I believe Jonas said uh, something in the beginning about being frustrated, like Googling, not finding anything about what entrepreneurs or business owners in general are doing to cope with what's going on. You find like the same like SEO article, that's like top 10 points on this generic subject that's not really going to help you out with what we have to do to pivot. So uh, I've had to do my own research, my own recognizance on that. And I started blogging. Uh, I started really becoming a blogger. And you've helped me with some of that, getting on Medium and stuff. And just really figuring out, okay, well, right now, I mean, it's been a mainstay for entrepreneurial life in general to try to fill gaps that the competition is not filling. But now even more so, okay, what is the competition not doing to our new adapted lifestyles of shelter in place, online digital stuff that we can fill those gaps in and meet the demands of customers now that aren't being met. And so I'm thinking, okay, I can share my insights and stuff like that through blogging and get that out there and go through that route and see what I can do. I'm working on a book that I've been leaving dusty for about a year. Now I can't avoid it. It's just staring at me every day. So working on that, just trying to redirect energy and focus to what I can control, not what I can't. And that's, a lot of what's helped me keep moving forward and, you know, still be successful. Well said. And, uh, and so what advice do you have for people in a similar space? My advice, don't give up hope. Uh, Governor Greg Abbott, for those of you watching in Austin, Texas, he issued a press release just the other day that they're trying to see with provisions to reopen up businesses um, in mid May ish. So I don't know how that's going to work and hopefully it's not going to spread the virus further. Who will be smart? Unlike people with body space at grocery stores who I get very, very upset to. <laughs> it's the same person. They keep bumping into you. Um, but I would say go crazy with customer service. One of the things that I've done to help my existing clients that didn't bail on me, it's not their fault. I understand. No resentment. No, Hey, no shade. Uh, is just make sure they're appreciated, go overboard, right? So the ones that I have still, you know, like the ones that run ads for Tony Robbins, I'm like, hey, what else can I do to help you out, right? I turn around time is faster for me. I get stuff done a lot quicker. Um, I say, hey, look, I also build landing pages. I'm also a writer. Like, what can I do for you? I do email marketing. What else can you use for my skill set, right? Doing that, uh, innovating and scale, like finding new ways to repurpose what you do to reach new audiences that are subsectioned of what you already do, right? That's a good way to, to deal with this. I would say, you know, making sure that you just figure out what your game plan is. I don't know what things are going to be like in the future. We may have to, each of us, go into new markets we haven't touched before that may be neighbor markets, niche markets to what we do, just so that we can continue serving people with our expertise and skills and keep that momentum going. Well said, Trevor. Um, I To kind of add to what you're saying, uh, I think that I have certainly heard a lot of uh, other business owners that are venturing into new territory to uh, supplement the revenue that was lost. And I also have heard um, uh, quite a few business owners say that they're doubling their customer service efforts. So once we go out of this uh, event and kind of go back to whatever normal winds up being, those people, uh, this is just my opinion, those people that will have uh, doubled their customer service efforts and they continue that, uh, uh, the resources in that direction, the people that are not doing that, they're gonna, I think, be at a competitive disadvantage and, uh, you know, you do things to please the customer and customers going to uh, really enjoy that extra love and attention. So I would uh, say right now, and I would to go off of that, I agree. And I would say right now is the perfect time to really develop your brand personality. Like what is the character, you know, what are the value sets of your brand? How does your own sense of purpose resonate with your audience? When you truly get into that space with your brand and you put your heart into it, it's not about making profits or checking off to-do lists, but it's about representing not just making sales, but wanting to help. How can what you do really help people? Refocusing that, 
people feel that they feel when the salesy vibes there, when you get cornered at that networking event by someone that just has to give you their pitch. Um, and they feel the difference with someone that just says, Hey, we're here to help. This is going to make a difference. And when you do that, that has longevity that, like you said, I think it's going to give those businesses the competitive edge over those that are still just trying to do the things the old school way, pre, pre-COVID, you know? Yep. And uh, so, Trevor, how can uh, people get in touch with you if they want to reach out? So my email is blogger at jetskishaman.com. And if that's hard to remember, trevor at trevorwgoodchild.com works as well. My blog is jetskishaman.com and it's a startup blog about entrepreneur tips and business news. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Trevor. And want to say thank you everyone for being on the call and appreciate your time. Uh, I I certainly learned uh, quite a few things and you guys are amazing people. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Sure. And, and then uh, if y'all could stay on just for uh, just a couple of minutes after this, this call, appreciate it. Uh, have a couple questions to ask. So, um, so thank you everyone else for uh, tuning in and um, we'll be putting this on Facebook uh, and, and I'll be inserting graphics, lower thirds and doing my magic and putting it on uh, my LinkedIn and Facebook and some other promotional channels. So thank you so much for, for coming.